Hello, Kansas kids. I'm Governor Laura Kelly, and I'm here to take you on a virtual tour of the Kansas State Capitol here in Topeka. Here's Joe Brentano. Joe gives tours in the Capitol all of the time, and I can tell you he is the best. So get it started, Joe. Well, thank you, Governor. This is a great honor. We don't normally get to come back to the private space, and there's some really beautiful, wonderful things, and most notably, we're going to start here with the George Stone mural. Now, Stone was a native of Topeka, born in 1858, and he was trained in Europe and other places, and he really came back to Topeka, and along with publisher and cartoonist Albert Reed, began what would then eventually become the Washburn University Art Department. He was known for his landscapes and portraiture, but this Spirit of Kansas was commissioned sometime in the early 1900s. We talk a lot about in Kansas history freedom from slavery, the Spirit of Kansas. So you'll notice at the bottom left the shackles there of the former slaves. So the Spirit of Kansas has a lot of things, that spirit of freedom and inclusion. Hey guys, this is my actual office. This is where I work. You can see up on the walls, we've got a number of absolutely stunning photographs. Uh, these were done by my friend Judith Sabatini. She's an artist and she focuses on the Flint Hills. Uh, so over here, uh, I've got a lot of leftover stuff from the 14 years I spent in the state senate. Lots of, lots of good gigas. One of my favorites uh, is this uh, box of baseball cards. Uh, this is actually Joe DiMaggio. Uh, some of you may have heard of him. He's a very famous New York Yankee. They called him the slugger. I was a Yankees fan uh, when I was a kid. My, da my dad and my mom were born in New York, as was I, and so I grew up as a Yankees fan. I love the Royals now. So, And the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court also was a Yankees fan, and he gave these to me uh, as a gift. So one of my favorite things. Up here, you're going to see an elephant. Uh, if you know uh, the symbols of the political parties, uh, Democrats have donkeys, Republicans have elephants, and my Republican friends in the Senate gave that to me uh, when I broke my femur in a parade, and they gave that to me as a get well gift. So, Governor, working in this space, what are some of the most important things that you've worked on while in the office? Well. Absolutely no doubt that the most important thing that I've done since I've been governor, aside from trying to get us through this public health crisis, uh, was the passage of the school finance bill, where we finally started you know, giving our schools enough money to do the job uh, that they're entrusted to do. So that getting the school finance bill passed was the most important thing. We're in what's called the governor's ceremonial office. Uh, this is where people come in uh, if they're being recognized for a special award uh, or if we're proclaiming you know, a month as National School Month. Uh, everybody will come in here to have their picture taken with the governor. Uh, if you were to come here as a page uh, during the legislative session, you would come in here in the morning and have your picture taken with the governor. With that, I'm going to let Joe uh, tell you a little bit about this room. Well, there's some really wonderful things in here, and most notably is the Landon desk, which has a really incredible story there. Alf Landon was a successful businessman. He was our governor in the 30s, very popular governor. He would even run in the 1936 a ticket for the Republican nominee for president against uh, Roosevelt. And he did not win that election, but thus remained very popular. Mm -hmm. This desk is very special because apparently Landon liked to work with his assistant close by. So this is a special custom-made desk known as a partner desk. And you may notice there are drawers on each side, so two people can work together uh, at it. Another special thing, it was built by the Kansas State School for the Deaf in Olathe, Kansas, in their cabinet-making department. Now, many of you know Alf Landon's daughter, Nancy Kassebaum, was for many years our U.S. Senator, and she was instrumental in having the desk donated here to use in the ceremonial office. Apparently, Landon liked to put his boots up on the desk. So you might notice some marks at the top there, and she specifically did not want those buffed out. She wanted the public to see how her father had used the desk. As you know, I'm the governor of the entire state of Kansas. In the state, we have 105 counties. Every county has a courthouse as the center of the county.
So what I wanted to do was to show off that part of Kansas. Uh, so I asked the Kansas Historic Society uh, to put together a uh, collection of, all, of photographs of all of our courthouses. Uh, and we've got 14 of them up now. Uh, the Historic Society will come and take these down and put up 14 more. Uh, and we'll continue to rotate them so that all 105 county courthouses will be displayed in the ceremonial office over the course of my first term. So now we're on the second floor of the state capitol right outside the governor's office. Joe, what have we got? What we have here is probably one of the more remarkable pieces of artwork in our capital. It's certainly the most well known and it's John Stuart Curry's tragic prelude. Curry's a native Kansan. He was commissioned in the mid-1930s to design murals for the second floor and his idea was to lay this out like a timeline of Kansas history. So for instance, I'm going to start over here with the Spanish explorer Coronado and Padre Padilla. In the history of the Santa Fe Trail, we don't often think of the Spanish influence, but it is very important there, the trading route from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, Coronado comes over into the North American interior. Now he's originally, he's looking for gold to take back to Spain with him. So this mythical tale, the kingdom of Quivira draws Coronado this far into the North American interior. We know he gets to about Lindsburg, Kansas before he realizes there's just no gold here on the prairies. Moving on to the other side of the arch, you get into that era of the buffalo hunters and plainsmen and the buffalo roam the prairies of the North American interior and Buffalo Bill and certainly others came. Curry did not paint this figure to be Buffalo Bill, but you could certainly think of somebody in his era like him. Unfortunately, they hunted or killed so many of the bison or buffalo at one time, they were nearly considered extinct as a species there. Now behind me, we're gonna get really into the focal point of the mural there. John Brown came from the east there, and he was not only passionate, but he fully believed that slavery was inhumane and he would do anything necessary to stop not only the expansion of slavery into Kansas, but totally abolish the institution all over the U.S. Now it's interesting the way Curry has Brown portrayed. Look at him in this image. He's larger than life. I'll tell you, he wasn't really 11 feet tall. But the artist Curry is trying to tell us something about Brown. So he's painted him larger than life. A couple very important symbols in his hand. In his left hand, he has that Bible, that open Bible. But look over what's in his right hand there. He has the rifle there, the Sharps carbine rifle. John Brown is really the lightning rod that begins that move. It. He's really to go to any means to a achieve the goal of abolishing slavery. So you see John Brown in the center, you've got that division on both sides of him. So Curry has the generally the Union portrayed over onto the left with the U.S. flag there, and over on the right you have the Confederacy there. In the middle, at the heart of the issue, are the slaves over which the issue is about. And then the coming Civil War. So Curry has the two soldiers, both portraying the Union in the blue and the Confederate in the gray the more than a million and a half that would make that ultimate sacrifice uh, during the coming Civil War. You've got the trail systems west, so you see some pioneers and wagons moving westward there. But symbolically, Curry puts these things into the mural. That symbolic of the gathering storms of the Civil War have roots in that Kansas-Nebraska Act. And the, equally, the symbolism of a prairie fire. Think about a prairie fire. You're burning off the old fields because you want to make way for the new change, the new growth to come along there. So think about this time in U.S. history. It's very important, this lead up to the Civil War and eventually the 13th Amendment to the Constitution to abolish slavery. Kansas has a really significant role in U.S. history and Curry recognized that in this artwork with the symbolism there. Well, here we are in front of Curry's uh, Kansas pastoral. This is the third part of the, the, the timeline that Curry designed and this is really the ideal unmortgaged farm meant to represent the modern Kansas. Now I mean modern in the 1930s. So his focal point really here is that farm couple and how important they are to the culture, the character of our state. And when we get to the last section of the mural, it's the prairie at night. 
Perhaps the prairies are one of our greatest natural resources there. Prairie has gotten quite discouraged at the lack of support he had. Unfortunately, he did not sign the work because he didn't feel it was finished. Here we are, still on the second floor, but now we're in what's called the rotunda. This is sort of the central hallway uh, of the State House. And what we're going to talk about here uh, will be this mural up here, which has a one room schoolhouse like kids used to go to in Kansas, and then also a very special person in Kansas history. Joe. The one-room schoolhouse was often the center of the community and the teacher was responsible for all the curriculum for several grades, first grade up into the eighth grade there. So she would be responsible for reading, writing, and arithmetic, the basics. They used slates and slate pencils and that was their very basic supplies. The teacher was responsible for giving all the lessons for all the grades and of course it was the blackboard that was the main tool, sort of the iPad of its day, I suppose, where all the lessons would be written down. And the students were expected to do recitations for testing and such. The older grades might bring in wood for the potbelly stove. Younger kids might be assigned to clean the blackboards and clean those wool felt erasers, clap them together was often one of the fun things. The teacher uh, might have a map in the classroom, a globe, and if the teacher was musical, there would often be a piano available uh, there. So a bit about the one room schoolhouse. They were common in Kansas even up into the mid 1950s, but consolidation really uh, closes a lot of the schools and the need for more technical learning at the later grades there. So Lumen Martin Winter specifically has this schoolhouse placed in here and notice the teacher is leading the children to the shelter there because of the tornado. But I'll share with you, you might notice there is one young man in the foreground not paying attention to his teacher. Well, that happens to be the artist. Winter painted himself in the painting. He grew up near Larned, Kansas, and it said he patterned that schoolhouse to look like the one he attended growing up there. So that's one of the eight panels we're going to focus on in this tour. But next to the panel over here are the statues. There are four of these done by Pete Felton from Hayes, Kansas. And he was commissioned in 1981 to design the statues. They're carved out of Silverdale limestone, which is a variety from South Central Kansas. And right here we have uh, one of our best known Kansans, pilot aviator Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart grew up in Atchison, Kansas there, and her parents and grandparents uh, wanted her to have a sense of adventure. Her and her sister Muriel were encouraged to explore, and one of the best known stories is they created a roller coaster out of some roller skate wheels as a child, and she got her sense of flying from that example as a child there. She would go on to educate herself there and be involved in many issues, but mostly learning to fly. She'll set many speed records. I think in the 1930s, she will uh, be the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic. And of course, she wanted to be the first person to do something. So her goal was to circumnavigate or fly around the globe. And in that attempt in 1937, she gained uh, fame there, but she did not make it, of course, all the way around the world. She was lost over the Pacific in 1937. So today we still think about that spirit of adventure that Amelia Earhart had. I'm told these statues weigh about 2,000 pounds a piece, so something we don't want to move off in there. You know, the laws of Kansas are made right here in the state capitol. I'm standing in the Kansas House of Representatives chamber. Your mom and dads elect the folks who come here to help make the laws. I'm going to let Joe tell you a little bit about this facility. Thank you, Governor. Well, our house is made up of 125 representatives. They come from districts from all over the state, and the districts are population-based, so each one represents roughly 24,000 Kansans, and they're elected to serve a two-year term. We don't have term limits on our legislators in Kansas, so they may be elected to serve multiple terms there. Members are seated by their political affiliation, and you've got the leadership in each of the parties 
and their desks are up front. The large chair up front at the top of the podium or rostrum is where the speaker sits. The speaker is chosen by the group to serve as the leader. Clerk set below and the podium in front is the well of the chamber where our laws are vetted and uh, debated here. They have a procedure here in the house. Every member has buttons at their desks and they must uh, be recognized by the chair to uh, then when they are recognized, they will go up front and debate at the podium. And there are two microphones up there. So you might be standing next to your colleague debating the pros or cons of these bills or ideas that potentially could, be, could become our state law. Now, when the members are ready to vote, they do it electronically. So at each of their desks, they have a series of buttons, a yes and a no vote. And the voting results appear on the voting boards, which are at the top of the chamber. Because we're not in session right now, the voting boards sit flush in the wall and you hardly notice they're even there. But during session, you would see an LED light display and you would get an immediate feedback of how your representative is voting. You must be able to see that on the voting boards. And that's a little bit different process than they do in the Senate. And we'll talk about that when we go over uh, there. The gallery is up on the fourth floor. The public gallery is open to anyone when they are debating and discussing bills during the 90 day session. Our Kansas Constitution says our legislature must meet annually for 90 days. And typically the session is from January to early May, they can go shorter or longer or can be called back into a special session to address something as necessary. I want to focus a little bit on the historic things in the room. This wing of the building it was finished in 1881 and this decor reflects that era. And if you look on the ceiling, you've got these wonderful murals here. These were recently restored because for many years they had been covered up with paint. The themes are justice to the back of the room the first dawn of liberty at the right or north. Law is above the rostrum at the front of the room and history is above me over on the south side of the room. They restored not only the beautiful murals but all the ceiling colors and patterns and they uncovered the 10 names above the windows. They had been covered up as well for many years. All of these men had something to do with Kansas as a free state. You recognize John Brown. Now over to the north, you've got J.H. Lane, Jim Lane. Lane organized the Lane Brigade, fought in the Civil War. The Lane Freedom Trail was something he pioneered. And that was a network of the Underground Railroad that ran north to Topeka up into Nebraska. This is absolutely my favorite place in the entire state capitol. I spent 14 years here serving in the state senate, sitting at this very desk. Now, let's go over to Joe and talk about the chamber. Well, welcome to the senate. And their state senate is made up of 40 members. And again, they are elected by districts based on population. Senators have a four-year term and they represent a larger constituent base of about 70,000 Kansans. So the Senate has a longer uh, term. They provide that leadership role over time. Whereas remember with House members, they serve the two-year term. So if voters want changes more quickly, you have that opportunity. So the idea of the two House legislature and some of the check and balances they provide. Now behind me, the Senate also chooses a leader. He or she is known as the Senate president. So the large chair at the rostrum is for Senate president. Clerks sit below and those student pages Pages are 12 to 18 year olds that come and work for the day for their representative or senator and uh, get to take part in the process. So if you're a page, you get to sit up front here. Now, unlike the house, remember, that had the large podium in the center, each senator has their own microphone. So the senators stand from their desk to address the group. They don't have to come up front as they do in the house. And notice on the desk, there are no electronic buttons or tabulations for voting because in the Senate, it's by division of the assembly, an oral, a yay or nay vote. So no digital voting boards over here. You really have to pay attention and listen to the voting in the Senate. So a little bit of some of the differences between the house and Senate. This wing of the building is the original and is the earliest wing of the Capitol. And in the early days, the room accommodated both the House and the Senate. 
until 1881 when the house moves to their own wing and it's later in 1885 that the room you see today was designed there. It really reflects some of the high Victorian style and unlike the house that changed so much through the years, the Senate really retains most of its original features. I think one of the uh, marvelous things in here are the copper columns there. Italian artisans did all the metal work and notice the columns are set up on those boxes with the air grill underneath. That was unique and it helped draw up the warm air and circulate. As you know, warm air rises and it ventilates out. Today, they are still connected into the modern ductwork system and still function as they were originally intended. All of our elected legislators have an office in the building. So when you come here to visit during session, you can visit them. In the east wing here on first, second, and third floor, we have mostly our state senator's offices in there. You got the west wing of the Capitol here where we have representative offices and the constituent services office down the hall. We are now on the third floor and we're in the official Kansas State Library. This is an absolutely remarkable facility and I hope you have a chance to come visit this yourself. But in the meanwhile, we're going to have Joe uh, describe what's going on in here. But before I give it over to Joe, I want to tell you that Annie Diggs was the very first state librarian who actually worked in here. And she was famous not only for being a state librarian, but also because she was very active in establishing women's right to vote. She was a suffragette. So Annie's really remarkable, as you said, Governor, and her role, she was self-educated and she was a very highly sought after speaker. She got a lot of her speaking experience through uh, her church in Lawrence, um, but also would later travel to Europe and other places. She lobbied both the major political parties to adopt women's suffrage. And when they refused that, she really got involved with populists of the era um, there, and they adopted that platform of women's suffrage. And they also represented farmers and small business and the temperance movement, the moderation and the consumption of, of alcohol. All of those movements kind of coalesced there and Annie was really um, well sought after. And by 1898 when she was appointed the library, it's on that strength of her character that she had this room designed, and I say it that way, she insisted on having these bookshelves ordered from a company out of Jamestown, New York. And they're a solid, a high quality steel, and they have built-in book lifts there on each end. And the remarkable thing is the glass floors, the purpose allowing more natural light in there. You didn't have the modern bright electric bulbs, even though this was the first room to have electricity, still the glass augmented and helped allow more natural light in there. She wanted the image of the sunflower and the brass railings that you see below uh, there. So Annie really had a vision for this and her strength of character. Every state has a library system. However, they're not always located in the capital. Ours has always been here. Any Kansan can use the resources here. There are a lot of a repository of federal documents. Anything you'd want to know about Kansas, Kansas history, uh, laws that have been passed can be researched right here. Maybe you're a Kansan that can't travel to Topeka. You can go through your local library and get a state e-library card to access all of the resources here. We're on the third floor of the state capitol, right outside the old Supreme Court room. A new addition to the state capitol was this mural done in 2018. Uh, it depicts one of the most important events that ever happened uh, in the state of Kansas and that probably has the biggest impact on your schools today. Joe, why don't you tell us about this? Yeah, Governor, like you said, the first new mural or artwork in over 40 years there, and there is visually a lot to see in this. Uh, artist is Michael Young, native Kansan from Leavenworth. There's a lot of images in here, so let's start on talking about the Brown versus Topeka Board of Education decision in 1954. There, let's start with the two schools involved in Topeka. There were schools in Kansas that could segregate based on race. So in Topeka, at the top left, you have the Sumner School. Notice at the top right is the Monroe School, the segregated 
um, school for African American children, and that was really unfair. So with the local NAACP, they started to pull these cases together, and they would be uh, wrapped up and taken all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. In fact, those five flags at the top right are the other states involved, which are South Carolina, Virginia, Kansas, Delaware, and the District of Columbia. They choose Oliver Brown as the lead plaintiff because in Topeka, Kansas, the two schools, Sumner and Monroe, were about the same age. So equal facilities, teacher salaries between white and black teachers were competitive and textbooks were up to date. What we're trying to prove is separate but equal is still unequal. So that's part of the reason why Oliver Brown is listed as the lead plaintiff. But all those cases are rolled together. They'll be argued all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, which is the building depicted in the center background, and it was unanimous in 1954. All nine justices agreed separate but equal is inherently unequal. And that would begin the process of desegregating public schools all over the U.S. there. Now, Michael Young's focus is that integrated classroom. And there's a lot of wonderful detail in here, things you might identify with, but I want to draw your attention to the man in the photo frame on the teacher's desk. And he is the attorney, Thurgood Marshall, who would lead those oral arguments to the Supreme Court. Later on, Marshall would be appointed as the first black associate judge on our U.S. Supreme Court much later in 1960. Seven there. So a lot of the image here, you kind of have over here on the left the challenges and the adversity to integrating schools, and over on the right, the positive outcomes and that idea if we can all learn and have an opportunity to uh, have an education that we can all achieve our potential. Again, a lot to see in here. And what do you see particularly in the mural? We've come to the end of our tour of the Kansas State Capitol. I want to thank Joe so very much. Uh, you did a fabulous job. I'm sure the kids uh, will enjoy it. And I want to thank all of you for taking the time to watch this. I hope so much that very soon you'll actually be able to come here and meet Joe and have a tour of the Capitol in the actual building. You all take care.